Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the East West Center. Uh, delighted to have you today for this program on uh, the domestic political situation and foreign policy trajectories in Thailand with a well known star of Thai and Southeast Asian studies. Uh, so many of you already know Pavan, and um, we're delighted to have him back here at the East West Center uh, for this program today, which he graciously offered to do. And it couldn't be better timing, as many of you know, not only because of the intrinsic importance of Thailand, the U.S.-Thai alliance, the elections, but also Thailand's upcoming ASEAN chairmanship this year. So there's just a number of reasons why uh, Thailand is important and why the timing of Pavin's presence here is, is so uh, propitious. Um, he's going to speak for about 45 minutes or so today. He said lay out his view. He has a couple of PowerPoints, so I'll get out of the way. And then we'll move to uh, Q&A. And um, we'll take about 35 or so minutes, uh, 40 minutes or so for that. Just the ground rules today, just so that everyone knows, we are live streaming. And so it is the entire program is on the record. Um, and there'll be a, a recording of the event as well posted to our website in addition to the live stream. So I know people are still getting their lunch and getting settled, but I do want to start because we really want to maximize Pavan's um, uh, presence here to, to hear from him. And thank you so much for doing this. I should also flag, you have his bio, but just to flag that this is out now. Uh, in his tenure as the editor of the uh, Southeast Asia Kyoto, uh, Kyoto Review of Southeast Asia, and the collection under your chairmanship of the of the publication is now out. So I would commend this to you. And there's a free download as well. So it's a massive thing. So in case you want to uh, pick and choose by going online, you can do that. Pavan, welcome, and thank you for doing this. And please, it's your show now. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you for the invitation, Sadhu. Uh, well, okay, I will start uh, for the sake of time. Uh, today, what day? Was it 23rd, 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 Tuesday. At the early hour of Monday, the 8th of July, at around 4.45 a.m., a man uh, dressed in black, with masks, broke into my apartment in Kyoto. And while I was asleep with my partner, the guy managed to walk into my bedroom and I did not know anything, I did not know anything about it. Then this person slide the door, walk into my bedroom, pulling the blanket so that they would, you know, I would be expo exposed. And then they attacked me and my partner with chemical spray. Before they ran off, we we managed to run after this man, but but eventually the guys sort of escaped successfully. Uh, shortly, the Japanese police arrive uh, with the forensic team. Uh, they seem to understand the context, my context. So uh, they seem to suggest that uh, this could have been linked with <coughs> politics in Thailand. So, uh, so they send a team under the international terrorism of the Japanese police to investigate my case. So since this happened, I was told not to return to the apartment. So I have been put under safe house. So, uh, and then I just left uh, Kyoto for this trip. So maybe it might be a good thing to allow the Japanese uh, police to concentrate on the, on the investigation. Why I mention this? I think toward the end of my talk, especially on the part of the royal transition, I, I will try to explain to you uh, the, the threat uh, that dissident overseas has been facing under the current uh, reign of uh, the new monarch. But before I, I, I go into such detail, let me start you know, from the beginning. This is just sort of an introduction, uh, and I do not just want to uh, uh, dramatize it so much because my I think my life has been dramatized quite a lot <laughs> since the coup. So anyway, uh well let let's talk about the what really happened in, in Thai politics. So you would say here is a long drawn crisis. Uh 
Well, we are now in 2019. If you really want to look at the, the source of the Thai conflict, you might have to go a little deep into not just the past few years, but in fact, it, it really started since the Thaksin, you know, phenomenon came to Thailand in 2001. You know, we know that Thaksin has had been so successful as prime minister, and uh, today uh, remaining the only prime minister, elected prime minister, to have served full four-year term. You know, since 1932. Sometimes it's really hard to believe that uh, <coughs> no other government was able to stay uh, for full term, unlike uh, Thaksin uh, government. So after 2005, because Thaksin became so successful, and because of that, uh, he had been perceived as some sort of threat to the traditional power in Thailand. And you know that in 2005, uh, there emerged the, uh, the anti-Thaksin uh, demonstrations you know, by the PAD, the People's uh, uh, Alliance for Democracy, 2005. That was the start, the start of also the yellow shirt phenomenon. Why yellow shirt? We all know because it's a symbol of the Thai monarchy. In many ways, uh, the anti taxing demonstration was sort of endorsed by, by the establishment, by the monarchy. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite a powerful message because by linking uh, the, pro the, 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 the protest with the need to defend uh, the royal institution that what that make it so powerful and also in some way legitimize uh, the protest as well. So uh, we know that it started two thousand and five, and then it culminated, you know, in January two thousand and six, following the sale of uh, Shin Corps to Demasek. At the beginning of two thousand and sixteen, uh, Taksin thought that he could get away with it, but in fact he did not. It sort of provided, you know, another good reason for. Uh, the demonstrator to go ahead with an attempt to overthrow uh, Thaksin. Uh, he dissolved the parliament back then. Uh, it did not help the situation. The coup eventually took place in September 2006. Uh, just a footnote, I came from uh, Dubai, uh, arriving in DC just only yesterday. While in Dubai, I also had a chance just only a few days ago to interview Thaksin once again for three full days. So uh, hopefully I might be able to share a little bit of our conversation. Uh, of course, uh, I can't I cannot say a lot. So I have to respect him as well, but I will I, I will say what I can say toward the end of our conversation, our recent conversation. So I mean yes, this is a toxin trap, you know, of 2006 and toxin uh, had to go. How we look at this uh, conflict in 2006, which I think still very much relevant to the, the, the current crisis in Thailand. I mean, say crudely, this is about the clash of two networks, you know. Dr. Metta Go came up with this term, network monarchy, and he sort of suggests that the best way to look at, to understand Thai politics is to understand political network in Thailand. And for him, you know, from the 1970s, at least until 2001, there has only been one powerful network, and that has been network monarchy. So network monarchy uh, had been ongoing, uh, you know, very sort of dominant in Thai politics, working with other key institutions, informing a part particular kind of politics whereby elected government has to be sort of has to be kept weak or vulnerable. Should there emerge as you know strong government, then that would be dealt with in different way. Most of the time. They were dealt with uh, military coup. That's why Thailand have had military coup for 20 something times. I lost count. So uh, when I told my student, you know, I said I, I you know I should not be proud that Thailand hold this record of having the most military coup in ASEAN. Right. Now that Thailand is a chair of ASEAN, so it's time to talk about this too. Uh, yes, this is about the, the clash between uh, network monarchy and the, and the taxi network. But I said this only crudely because in fact, there's more detail to the crisis rather than just being only the two networks because we have to talk about people on the ground too. But I mean, it's, it's easier to put it this way at this point. So this is about the old way, uh, the, the old way of dominant, the dominating politics you know, through uh, royal power. Uh, Taksin has shown that that could become outdated, right? Taksin has also, I mean, he exploited electoral process 
as a vehicle for him, you know, to, to seize political power. So in many ways, if you want to give credit to Thaksin, one of the credits has to be he opened up political space for a fair contest. You know, if you want political, political, political power, then let's contest fairly. I think that's what Thaksin tried to do. And I think Thaksin has done quite successfully, despite, you know, what happened during the Thaksin era as well. Uh, yes, I mean, this, this, is, this is about Thaksin showing that the old way might not suit Thailand uh, changing political and economic landscape, right? In other words, maybe if there's, there's no guys called Thaksin, Thailand might have ended up this way too because of the, the development within, as I said, the, uh, the economic and, and social landscape of Thailand. When I say it become outdated, I remember when I went uh, to do field work in Isan in Thailand and then uh, interviewing a number of hardcore red shirts. We know that a lot of these red shirts, they are key supporters of Thaksin. I said that, you know, why you, why you like Thaksin so much, right? I mean, this interview took place after Thaksin was overthrown. So a number of people said, well, because, you know, he gave us sort of uh, policy that, that becomes so beneficial for their everyday life. You know, we are talking about uh, populist policy. Uh, Thaksin handed over, you know, a lot of goodies, you know, in the back. And then there's, there's one lady, Rachel lady, you know, very, what she said very, very interestingly. She said that in the past, before Thaksin, uh, we got some sort of royal pouch, okay? When she opened the royal pouch, she would see inside this bag, she would see soap, you know, uh, toothpaste, you know, toothbrush, sort of canned food, and they were very exciting. They said, oh my God, we survived now. Okay, 20 or 30 years later, Thaksin also offered the same sort of pouch. Then they open it, and what they see in Thaksin pouch, they see handphone, they see, uh, you know, uh, satellite, they see, you know, iPad, this and that. And they said that, look, I would not want to go back and get toothpaste again. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I mean, yeah, there, there's a lot, a lot to interpret, you know, just from, you know, basic conversation. You could see that, you know, the old way of dealing with Thai politics soon became so outdated, you know, under, under you know, taxing introduction of new kind of politics in Thailand. So uh, this is what I would say. You know, he sort of introduced uh, electoral politics uh, to, 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 to Thailand too. Thaksin was very cunning at the beginning, you know, by focusing only on the, on the north and the northeast. You know, the two regions combined produced the most eligible voters for Thailand. Thaksin knew that, you know, to conquer Bangkok and the south would be very difficult simply because Bangkok has not been very friendly toward Thaksin, more or less. They sort of beat the upper class you know, align, align themselves with the establishment. The South, we know that it has long been territory of the Democratic Party. So Thaksin only focused on the North and Northeast, and then the result showed that he was again very successful. Uh, at the height of the Thai Rak Thai Party, you would see the electoral map, the North and Northeast became totally red. So that's an evidence of how Thaksin became so successful too. Partly, we have to also explain then why the network monarchy was never successful in electoral politics. If Thaksin became so successful, then you have to look at the other way. I would say that you know, it's never been successful because the, the network monarchy has invested so little in electoral politics. They care so little about, about the voice of the people. Because they think that, you know, they have long dominated politics. Should anything happen, then, you know, military coup would be the main, you know, uh, instrument for, for the establishment, for the monarchy, for the network monarchy to continue to hold on to that domination. In where they invest is so little because they also knew that it's very difficult to control or manage electoral results, right? Uh, Unlike the coup, they can they can completely control the situation. But with electoral result, uh, it, it can be really challenging for them. So that's why they would never have trust in the electoral politics at the beginning. I mean, this is one sad thing about Thai politics. Thai politics. Had they been very serious about investing in electoral politics, then you know they might continue to hold on to power with some sort of legitimacy, but because they sort of have refused to do so. So this has become uh, the key point that I would like to say at the outset. 
Now, moving forward to the coup of 2014. So, the first one, uh, not only like the first one, but in, in, in <laughs> the first one, my God, it is ago. But, but I mean, within this decade, right, we, we I, I, I call this the second one then, because it's linked to the Shinawat family. 2014, there's a lot of differences uh, between coup of 2006 and 2014. Uh, I, I would say that 2006 was more or less about an attempt to eliminate the toxin threat, to remove the toxin threat from Thai politics. And at the beginning, at the beginning, they believed that they were successful. But soon, it showed that what they thought was wrong, what they thought was good coup, in fact, it turned out to be quite bad coup. Uh, well, I. I Publish a book, Good Book on Bad, just a mini promotion, so as you can go and look for this book. I quite like the catchy title. So, this Good Book on Bad seemed to uh, argue that, yeah, what they think was Good Book, in fact, it turned out to be disastrous. Uh, 2014, it was just more than about eliminating the Chinawat germs from Thai politics, because by 2014, Ying Lak was uh, sitting on top of you know, the Thai political structure. Uh, she led uh, the Pur Thai party and winning landslide election in 2011. So, but then the timing was, was important. When I said it different, because this time, it was not just about removing toxin, but it was about how to manage the upcoming or the imminent royal succession. I think for them, this is very crucial. So I would argue, I mean, at this point, 2014 was more about managing royal succession at the same time as they want to you know get rid of uh, of the china one from politics too why they want so badly to control the royal succession because for the longest time king kumipon we know that you know he was much revered by a lot of times you know the king has you know presented you know i mean he presented himself as sort of uh, national stability you know at one point also unifying force you know, in Thai politics. A lot of institutions, including the military, the judges, middle and upper class in Thailand, they have all, uh, you know, invested so much in the monarchy. So when it comes to the end of the Pumipon era, they started to become anxious that what would happen once King Pumipon, you know, left the scene. Oh my God, who would, that, who would then come to protect our political interests? I mean, they, become, they became increasingly anxious when they realized the, the reputation of his son, who would become the next king. In fact, he is current king of Thailand. So that level of anxiety, I would argue, you know, became main driving force for 2014 British coup. So they thought that should they allow Ying Lak and class Taksin, we know that you know Yingla was sort of a puppet of, of, of Taksin. Should they allow a Yingla and Taksin, you know, being in power when uh, Thailand, you know, uh, had to deal with royal succession, they fear that this could cause sort of power shift, which which might not be beneficial to the elite, to the political elite, or to the establishment. Again, in many ways, these people look at Thai politics as a sort of zero sum game. Okay, either we take all or tax in take all. So I think in many ways also it, it is quite surreal and not that realistic. But well, you know, they have been holding on to power for that long. You know, Bunpon has been with us for seven decades. You know, I think it, it is understandable for us, you know, to, to try to, to one what can we say to try to understand why they think that the, 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 the management of process session was important. When they look back, the Thaksin phenomenon has never stopped. I put here Thaksin won election in 2001, again 2005, 2007, and then 2000 and, and 2007 and then 2011. Indeed, his party also won 2019, you know, in terms of having the most <coughs> parliament, parliamentary seat. But of course, we know what happened you know, in, in, in the current, in, in, in the recent election, how of that point. But what time says that within the period of 10 years, nothing can be the toxin phenomenon. 
even after Thaksin left the country and you know living in exile, but the Thaksin influence has remained so immense. Ying Lak uh, was a slap in the face of the old power. Again, despite so many attempts to bring them down. You remember 2007 with Samak Sutaret as Prime Minister. 2008, they tried to dig up the Kriya Temple to be sort of, you know, uh, a reason to, to get rid of Samak, you know, by accusing the Samak government of, you know, working with the Cambodian leadership in order to keep away, you know, certain uh, territories of Thailand. For Cambodia. Then 2000, late 2018 also when Thaksin picked uh, his own brother-in-law Song Chai Wong Sawa, then it led to the occupation of the international airport, you know, causing so much chaos for Thailand for two, uh, for, for one long week. So, you know, every single step, they just want to, to, to remove, you know, the Thaksin impact our politics. But then they realized that they could never be able to do so, especially being, with being luck. You know, coming here in uh, 2011. So because of that, Ying Lak had to go in 2014. But I mean, I could hear also that the popular, popularity of the Shinova, you know, has never faded. Until today, uh, people still talk so much about taxi, right? Ying Lak has been living outside, but you know, <coughs> looking at her activity over, the, over social media, you know, it's still very phenomenal, so much so. Okay, maybe a little bit less, after Thanathorn coming into the political scene, we can talk about the Thanathorn phenomenon also during the Q&A. So uh, we seem to, to be able to guess what's going to happen to Thanathorn next, right? Thanathorn could become the second toxin, uh, but, but that a bit later. So the whole thing is, you know, the, the, the Chinawat phenomenon has lasted for 10 years, coincided with uh, the looming end, not, not the looking end, the looming, the looming end of the of the Kumpon era, therefore, eliminate, elimination was needed. Royal succession. Uh, I did mention about the anxiety, and I still, you know, believe that you know, anxiety uh, represented the main reason why uh, why the military, you know, has has to do what the military has to do in order to defend the interest, you know, of the monarchy and also the military itself and other institutions uh, working for the monarchy for so long. The network monarchy, you know, relies so heavily on uh, King Wipon, you know, in uh, maintaining their uh, political interests. Uh, it might be a little bit useful to talk a bit on the network monarchy since we touched upon this uh, at the beginning. Uh, yeah, as I said, this has been powerful political network of Thailand. I think uh, the peak came, well, I mean, going back, you know, when, when King Pui Pon became king in 1946, you know, he was a young king. It took him sort of 10 years to realize that, you know, if he wanted to bring back the glorious day of the monarchy, he would be able to do so by working closely with, with military. And that when a uh, few marshals came into a critical scene and together, you know, they sort of started to build a kind of monarchy military alliance that also worked really well under the context of the Cold War in which the United States had become a part of it. The United States came here in order to also to maintain the interest of the U.S. in Thailand by again supporting the military and also the monarchy in Thailand. Uh, it had been like this for some years. And when I said that the peak came, I think it really came with Prem Dinsulano became prime minister in 1980s until 1988. So I have to mention Prem because people tend to believe that, you know, Prem was sort of a CEO of the network monarchy. You know, at the height of the fame, Prem era, you know, the, 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 the Privy Council, this is after Prem stepped down and the king appointed him to be the president of the Privy Council until the last day he passed away uh, not long ago. So we could say that the Privy, the, Privy, the Privy Council served as the main engine driving the network monarchy. What the network monarchy did during those times, you know, involved so much in sort of military reshuffle, putting the right man in the right job. This is very important, you know, to be able to control how how I mean the, the the power position within the military and also to work with the judges, you know, again at some point the, the judicial the, the judiciary, you know, had become sort of instrument of the neighbor monarchy too. And we see it more evidently, you know, from uh, the crisis, the, the recent political crisis, you know, maybe from 2008 
exactly with the case of Samak Sutarawet and also uh, with Song Cha and then even Ying Lat, you know, she was impeached, even she, it was, she was overthrown, then she was also impeached, you know, by the court too. And since then the court has been intervening Thai politics so actively. So this has been the role of the network monarchy so since uh, since Spain came along. It's also reached another peak in 1992 during the Black May incident. You know, if you look at the footage of the king meeting with the, 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 the two opposing sides, you know, with Suji Dan, with Jam Long Si Meung, I thought that was the peak of the royal hegemony in Thailand before it started to decline, you know, perhaps maybe after the, the financial crisis and then with Thaksin coming along. Okay. But back then, Network Monarchy was sustained because of certain personality of the king, King Pumipon. I have to mention this because you could see stark contrast with the current king too. So it, it would be easy to compare between two kings and why the, why the anxiety in the first place. So a revered king, I said here, uh, King Pumipon came with a new idea of building sort of neo-royalism. What is neo-royalism? Uh, basically, it's uh, is uh, is a trans transformation of the monarchy in Thailand, especially under King Bhumibol, uh, on three bases. One is you know to transform the king into something sacred. Okay. Second one is to make sure that the king remain very popular, and third to ensure that the king has this democratic aspect in him. Okay. Being sacred, we know that. Uh, you know, the king has been made into a sort of semi-god. So I will just stop there. We all know that. Becoming very popular, yes, there's a number of projects, including royal projects, that allow the king to work with the people on the ground. So this also has become, again, a main vehicle for Puebon to remain very popular. And last one, uh, to appear to be democratic. So the king would only uh, interfere in politics occasionally. Okay, he would only he would only interfere when Thailand hit sort of crisis, and you know you have to wait until there's sort of bloodshed. Then there would be royal intervention in order to stop the bloodshed. Right, this has been patterned along the way. You know, uh, the king would talk so much about about politics, about politicians. If you go back to listen to his speech, almost every single year, every birthday, it was you know, an important event of the year in Thailand in the past on the 5th of December when the king would give this, you know, speech uh, on the television. Not quite like what Queen Elizabeth gave during Christmas Eve. So that was sort of a bit soft. But in Thailand, it's sort of full-blown with a lot of political messages. One of the key messages that you, we have heard over and over was politics was dirty. Politicians are bad and corrupt. By saying this, then people would then interpret that, hmm, in that case, then what would be clean? What would be moral? Oh, it's monarchy. So monarchy become an alternative type of democracy in Thailand. To the point that we can even talk about this in the context of royal democracy. Now, the term royal, royal democracy in itself is uh, oxymoronic, right? Oxymoron. How can you put royal together with monarchy when one thing, you know, has to be accountable, but one thing you cannot even ask question. But this really happened in Thailand. You know, we talked so much during the King, uh, King Kong era about Thailand being, you know, run by sort of royal democracy that the king would provide sort of guideline for how democracy should be run in Thailand. And because of that, the king become <coughs> the main competitor, you know, to, to, to get that political power in Thailand for so long. So all in all, the king has become so, so successful in sort of becoming a kind of guarantee of political, political stability for a number of you know, stakeholders in Thailand. But King Washington, it's just something totally different, right? Uh, how should I start? If I start about King Washington, you might have to give me another two hours, but then I will cut this short. Well, whatever you see in King Wuhan, you would not see in King Washington. Whether he cares about this, I am not so sure. Okay, uh, <coughs> starting off with you know uh, that there has been no signs coming out of Washington about his 
his affection of democracy up to this point. I will talk about this a little bit, bit uh, later. But just to say also, there have been no signs coming out of the current king about about his willing his willingness to promote democracy in China. <coughs> his personal lifestyle, uh, his it, it becomes so eccentric, right? His uh, reputation, all sort of reputations, you know, his weird sense of dressing, you know, as you see in Munich, something like that. So. All these things has sort of eroded what Pumipon has built over the year. So if there would be something that really underpin the Pumipon era, I think Washington, the Washington coming to, to politics started to erode whatever come before him. But it's necessary that eventually he would erode as well. I think right now he tried to craft a new kind of politics, which will be different from what you have seen in Pumipon. Again, I'll go to that point. Coming back to, to the differences of the two kings, because of that, it, it is about the anxiety. King Washington. Okay. Uh, most analysts, you know, gave this wrong interpretation of King Washington. I remember too that I gave a lot of uh, interview to the media, you know, at the eve of the royal succession. And looking back, I was so embarrassed. Uh, that's why they said that being an academic, please do not try to predict the future. So I gave all the wrong prediction. You know, I mean, based on, based, of course, based on my observation of what I have seen during the Puyipon era, then I made early conclusion that, yeah, Washington could become weak king then because, you know, he was not sacred, right? He was not popular. And again, he's nothing to do with democracy. Well, this is sort of a kind of neo-royalism that sort of, uh, you know, encapsulate uh, the 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 in Iran. No, uh, so that what I said. Yeah, he would become weak king. I also remember that I said maybe to the point that he might be even manipulated by stronger institution like the military. So maybe the king could become a puppet of the military. That's what I said in uh, sort of late two thousand and sixteen. Obviously, up to this point, I think I am wrong. Because in fact, the, the reinforcement of the royal power has been so evidence. I'll go one by one. Why? I think it has been evidence. Uh, starting off with palace power rearrangement. Okay. In fact, it started even before King Puipon passed away. Puipon passed away in October 2016. But I think within the palace, you could see power shift even before the king passed away. Power shift meaning that uh, if you follow Thailand close enough, you will see that the new king, Biden, the, the crown prince, right, uh, started to remove people who were close to King Pumipon and started to replace them with his own people within the palace. One of the main, you know, evidence was uh, the, the, the personal secretary of King, king Pumipon. Uh, he was fire, okay, listen on, watch it all time. And look, look and look, look at what happened to him after that. Oh my God, it's, it's terrible, right? He was put in, into a re-education camp and then personally leaked out a photo of him, you know, having his hair, you know, cut short, this and that. So, uh, yeah, I mean, this is one of the things that, that there was a kind of power rearrangement. He put his people inside the palace and then get it off, you know, those who close to his father. Second one. To weaken the Privy Council. Now, the Privy Council was the main vehicle, as I said, during the, 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 the network monarchy time. Uh, I could see that it has been weakened over time since 2016. Bram had remained uh, the president of the Privy Council until the last day. Uh, he passed away, I think, uh, in May. Yeah. We knew that you know the two men, the two men could not get along. Meaning between Brain and Washington, you know, Brain says a lot of horrible things about Washington through the WikiLeaks, you know, especially when we started to think who would be next in line. Of course, we're talking about Washington, but there was another alternative, the more popular princess, Sitting Thorn. And in those conversations, there's a lot of conversation that Brain, you know, in fact, talked to the, the American ambassador. <coughs> A number of American ambassadors and then the, the report read, read out, saying something like they had no trust 
in Western Hong Kong, you know, Thailand would be better off with Siddhan Thorn becoming the next monarch of Thailand. So because of that, you know, Western Hong Kong knew about it. And then that's why uh, I said that there was sort of deep conflict between Western Hong Kong, Prem in particular, and in general, the Privy Council. So when Prem, when, when Western Hong Kong came, one of the things that Western Hong Kong did was, and this would link to the next one, con constitutional amendment. One of the main things within the constitutional amendment was to sort of indirectly weaken the Privy Council. But when the king asked uh, to ask the government to amend the constitution, especially the provision that would allow the king to stay outside Thailand without having to appoint representative or a regent. So this would have been this could have been the responsibility of Prem, the head of the Privy Council. Whenever the king leaves the country, the king was supposed to, to appoint a regent. But then the constitution was amended so that he could operate Thailand with remote control from Munich without that frame, you know, having to interfere into, you know, whatever going on between Russia and Hong you know, and, and his affair in Thailand. So I think in my, in my own uh, interpretation, I would say that this is a way to, to, uh, to weaken both the, the Privy Council and, and also frame. And also since then, you know, you hardly uh, seen any move, you know, made by the Privy Council. A lot of Privy Council were now, you know, I mean, are now someone closer to, to Watch Along Watch Gone, you know, and uh, another thing which also can prove an, as an evidence, the king, you know, personally handpicked uh, the, the army chief, General Apirat, without having to go through the Privy Council as in the past, okay? Uh, okay, constitutional amendment, right, with all this thing. And then the Crown Property Bureau taking over. You know, for, for the longest time, King Pon intentionally made this a little bit blurry, you know, oh my God, who in fact belong, you know, on the Privy no, on the Crown Property Bureau, right? King Pon perfectly made it a little bit blurry. So I think that's quite wise, you know, that also try to, you know, uh, stay away from public criticism of whether, you know, the monarchy has a uh, full control of this investment arm um, <coughs> of the monarchy. King Washington Gon, uh took over the Crown Property Bureau, I think in 2017, making him officially uh, the richest monarch in the world, you know, with an uh, estimated uh, fortune of 30 billion US dollars. Just a footnote, when I was a diplomat, Every time Forbes magazine came out with this richest monarch in the world report, right, and King Kuipon always sat on top of the list. Uh, as a diplomat, we have to say, no, no, it's untrue. So I was in Singapore for, for four years. As a, as a diplomat, I had to, you know, explain this to the, to the Singapore government that no, the report was distorted, the king was not that rich. Something like that. <laughs> At the same time, you know, Prince of Saudi Arabia would be so angry that he was put like number six or seven when he said that I should be the richest monarch in the world. So, I mean, it just so bizarre. Right now, there is no dispute. Okay, so it's official. So you could see the new king working at the same time as trying to, to centralize political power into his own hand. In other words, you know, <coughs> trying to turn Thailand into a sort of absolutist, royal absolutist state. Be careful, I'm not talking about absolute monarchy. I, I am using the term royal absolutism. I, I, I'm still not sure how, how different it could be, but I know for sure that I'm not talking about absolute monarchy. This is a new kind of politics, maybe give me a year or two. I might be able to explain better. So at the same time, as he moved into taking control of political power, he also moved into control financial wealth. So everything happened at the same time, okay? Uh, this is not to also mention a lot of weird things happening in Bangkok. Uh, the, the, the plaque, you know, of the revolution, revolutionaries disappeared. The new one replaced with weird statement on it, okay? Private fauna size, something like that. So, a lot of private property being taken away now become a part of royal property. 
for example, the zoo right in the center of Bangkok and a number of universities surrounding the Anand Ananta Samagom Throne Hall, including all places which used to belong to the public. Now the king moved to take over. My own observation too, I think maybe he tried to mimic what happened, say, with the British royal family. Then, you know, if you if you family with London, there's a number of, you know, locations and places and buildings, you know, belong to the royal properties. But what, what different what was that, you know, most of these things in the UK, uh, they opened it for the public, you know, even with St. James Park, you know, uh, some Regent Park, something like that, even though it belonged to uh, the monarchy, but yet it's, ha it's, it's open for the public. But we are reversing that. Not only this has been taken away, now becoming royal property, it has been sealed off from the public. Right. This somehow linked to what I said, royal abs absolutism. Last one, and I think, uh, I'm not sure how many I have left, uh, maybe another five minutes. What also happened at the same time is uh, the way that uh, the palace, the Thai state, uh, has dealt with dissident in a more ruthless way. Okay, that's why I, I mentioned at the beginning what happened to me. Uh, even though, you know, there has no uh, report from the police yet, but it would be very difficult to deny any kind of involvement from Bangkok. But it has been an ongoing trend, and I think every one of us should be alarmed of this ongoing trend. This ongoing trend seems to point that there's a, a kind of determination to eliminate dissidents, especially against the monarchy. You know, if you're against the military, they might be able to tolerate it. But once you become sort of critic of the monarchy, then you could become target. Okay, it started in 2016. Okay, uh, that would be the year that King Kuipon passed away. So uh, it started with 2016 with a prominent uh, racial dissident in Lao, uh, in the name of uh, DJ Sun Ho. You know, he operated underground uh, uh, program, you know, basically anti monarchist uh, program. So he disappeared from Lao, and until today, nobody found out what really happened to him. A year later, in 2017, another guy, a, a hard, hardcore racer, Koti, also a member of the UDD, okay, the, the, the Red Shirt uh, 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 movement, also has been uh, kidnapped, abducted, and again disappeared from Lao too. Uh, why it happened in Laos? Uh, is that's different between what happened in Laos and also in Cambodia? In Cambodia, I cannot go much into detail, but that that's, 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 that a system of protecting dissident, which you know sort of given green light, you know, from the authority in Cambodia. Let me put it that way. So that's why, to a certain extent, dissident in Cambodia have been protected. But this never happened in Laos. Well, I mean, they open up, you know, okay, you can come, you, you can seek uh, asylum here, but there would be no legal protection for you, okay? So that would be sort of becoming a loophole for the Thai authority, authority to just go there and then to kidnap them and to kill them. That's why it happened in Laos more than anywhere, anywhere else. So it happened in 2016, 17, and then it happened recently, uh, just only last Christmas, okay? At the beginning of, of, of December, three uh, dissidents in Lao, one of, one of them again was so prominent. His name is Surachai Sadan, an ex communist, also used to work for Thaksin as well uh, under the Thai Rak Thai Party. Uh, Surachai and his two assistants uh, they were kidnapped from their home in Lao. And then around Christmas Eve, the tree body was floated in the Mekong River. And then the way that these three were murder was so brutal, you know, they had you know, their hand tied and then the stomach opened up and then they pour concrete into the stomach so that the body could sink in the Mekong River. And then it's, of course, it was not, you know, the body flowed. Uh, then we start to realize that this has been, as I said, you know, sort of systematic uh, uh, <clears throat> abduction and then killing of dissident. A few months ago, Three dissidents also were uh, deported from Vietnam. This had never been news, but we know I mean, among in Thailand. Uh, 
one of them his name is Lung Uncle s n a m l u n g another prominent anti monarchist disappear from Lao we don't know what happened at the same time inside Thailand uh, at least three political activists were brutally attacked in broad daylight with the latest case of j a n i l a young political activist you know was attacked you know 10 a.m. in the morning on a busy road as well so uh, no wonder why you know I mean if eventually it arrived in Japan so I don't know whether you know it's gonna move to somewhere else you know for example Paris that would be uh, where most dissidents of Thailand reside in it okay my God I just totally run out of time no, I think. Yes, yeah, just give me more five minutes, and then whatever the rest, I could not speak. Then let's do it during the Q and A. The election, okay. Uh, I will go very quickly. This is as part of manage managing a royal succession, and also uh, they have to they have to plan it now long term how to maintain their their political power, and then they come up with with a way you know in order to prevent t a x i n g and also other. Other political alternatives in the form of future f o r t h party by rewriting a new constitution, you know that would uh, empower uh, you know other institution like the Senate. You know from now on the Senate would play an important role in Thai politics, uh, including other in independent organization uh, like the Election Commission, for example, the Human <coughs> Rights Commission. All of these organization they are now working on behalf or you know to protect the interests of the elites. Uh, continue politicization of the military and also the court. You know, uh, time after time, the court have continued to play role, and then it it is obvious that the court the courts have been politicized. Okay, this in many way you know help weaken the democratic institution in Thailand, and therefore uh, we did see the return of the Prayut regime. You know, after the election of March, right? Very quickly, uh, how this. Or you know, cause an impact on Thailand foreign policy. You know, we seem to shift from domestic politics now to you know to something also that I have been working on for for quite some time. Uh, it's it's very complex, and I don't think I would do a good job to just put it in five minutes. But I'll try my best. I mean, right now we sort of being caught between the two powers here, right? On one hand, United States, and on the other hand, uh, China. This has been put in a broader context. Of the ongoing competition between U.S. and China elsewhere, so Thailand could not really escape from the intensifying rivalry between you know the two power. The only the only thing that could make our case a bit different is because we basically almost like immediate neighbor to China. We really cannot run away from it, and also it it make it even more interesting simply because also the relationship between Thailand and United States too. We not just we we are not just a friend. But we are more than that with the United States. We have military alliance treaty together. You know, I mean, let alone Thailand being the the oldest ally of United States in the entire Asia Pacific. So that would put Thailand into a very you know a special position. Said you know fitting well with the ongoing debate on the Sino-US ties. Uh, I would put this very briefly. I think the US had to do what the US has to do in order to make to make sure that. Relationship would go smoothly. Bearing in mind that China is over there, pushing Thailand too hard, this would only drive Thailand into the orbit of China. Not doing anything on Thailand at all, <coughs> U.S. would be condemned of, you know, promoting dictatorship in Thailand. Since you r e supposed to uphold democratic principle, so in many ways I kind of understand the U.S. position here, and it is reflected in, for example, U.S. sanction right after the coup. It was so pathetic to see the U.S. announcing that we will suspend 4.6 million U.S. assistance to Thailand. 4.6 million mean nothing. We can't even buy helicopter in Thailand. So I mean, well, but that's that's why I said U.S. has to what U.S. has to do. What as as it is uh, you know stipulated within the U.S. Constitution, but you, the U.S. would not go beyond that. Okay. At the same time, China, you know, you if U.S. if the U.S. is taking interventionist approach, as U.S. has always been doing since the Cold War, we like to intervene, we like to intervene in order to make sure that our interest would be there. China would be something very different. I would say that China has been taking pragmatic approach. 
pragmatic means we will only do so when it suits us. We will not do it all the time. If anything, we do not want to do it at all. Meaning that the, the, the Chinese leadership want to make sure that you know we do not want to interfere in Thai politics. We are here just to do business. We are not interested in politics. Even though in reality, in reality of course, you, the China would also be interested in politics in Thailand. <coughs> Thai is the monarchy also very important too. Uh, especially, I think with China, uh, has been, it has been ongoing that the Chinese leadership really value uh, the Chinese Thai, especially with the princess. I think with United States, you know, it seems like all eggs have been put in one basket, Pui Pon basket. Now the Pui Pon basket has gone. It, it would be a challenge for the U.S. How would go from this point forward? How would the U.S. deal with New King? The New King that never give any sign of democratic support. This would be a great challenge. As for China, well, whether you like democracy or not, we don't care, right? As long as we have good leadership. So that's why, you know, it's very different in terms of stakes, in terms of approach between the two countries. Uh, Mr. Regime and the current government, well, I mean, as I said, it's, it's getting closer and closer. I mean, in my, in my conversation with Taksim, only a few days ago, he still think that, you know, Thailand would be better off, you know, going with China. Because for China, you know, in this decade, whatever, whatever the benefit we get from China was more tan tangible than whatever we, we ever get from the United States. You know, one thing is in terms of economy, you know, relationship between the two countries. That's it. Well, Pavan, you have given us so much to think about that I hesitate to ask you this, but I know this will be of interest to folks here, and yeah. you, you referred to it that you've just come on your way here by stopping in Dubai. Yeah. So could, could you just say just a few things that you can say about your interview? Uh, because he's such a big player in the, in the way that you've cast this issue of two networks. So. Okay, you want me to talk about taxi? Yeah. Your okay. interview. Your interview. Dear Prime Minister, if you hear this, okay, please forgive me. Are you, are you publishing an interview? I don't know yet what to do with that. Okay, I can say certain things. Say, say well, certain things before we right. open up. For His sure. birthday is coming up on the 26th of July. He will turn 70. And he told me that I am ever so healthy. And he even did this to me. So which means I'm going to be here for a long time. So, uh, he also told me that he come to the conclusion, it might be a little bit late, but the conclusion is that maybe pleasing certain institution might no longer work. Maybe you have to try a new approach. I asked them what new approach do you think of, they so sort of did not give me, you know, clear. What and institution won't work? Well, key institution. Key institution. Okay. okay, got it. Okay. Might not work. Trying to reach out, trying to compromise and reconcile might no longer work. Uh, especially after the 8th February incident. This is something that I know I never mentioned about the, the princess wanting to become Prime Minister, mm -hmm. Princess Ubon Rat. I would save that for QA. So that also can be very interesting too. Yeah, I mean he said that well, I mean one of the things that it, it might no longer work the old approach. Maybe we might have to engage, engage with, with, with the people more. So I don't know whether I can interpret it as a sort of street politics or not. In other words, I don't know whether, whether there, was, there, 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 there was a message of maybe it's time for the Thai people to go on the street once again. If you try every single possible way, including behind the scene deal, including the political process, including committing to the electoral, electoral politics. But again, we continue to, to lose. Maybe we might have to find other way. Uh, his relationship with the new king. I would say this and I would end. He said that, uh, I would say, oh, how, how is your relationship with, with the current king? There's a lot of rumor about you, you know, at one point becoming quite friendly. He's, he said he said it quite wisely. He said, I know the crown prince, but I don't know Rama the ten. Okay. <coughs> Read the tea leaves further. Um, we have about 35 to 40 minutes or so. Let me just go around the room, please, starting with John Brandon and back. We'll work up. 
And remember, for those who came in late, the ground rules today are we are live streaming. The program is entirely on the record. John, Thank you, please introduce yourself. Sure. My name is John Brandon. I'm with the Asia Foundation here in Washington. Thank you, Satu, and thank you, Dr. Poppin. Um, I was struck by a comment that you made very early in your uh, remarks, talking about a villager in Isan saying when they got bags from the monarchy, mm. they got you know soap and a toothbrush and a canned good. And then Toxin was giving uh, you know cell phones and iPads and, and such. Um, after uh, the 2014 coup, the populist policies of Toxin continued. In fact, not only they, did they continue, they were enhanced. So these bags today that go up to Isan, what is in them? Mm. And in fact, there's some evidence, and Mike covered this recently, that the, that the current government since 2014 has also pursued some fairly populist policy oh, in the distribution. So there isn't a sort of firm line in this distribution sure. of populism. Well, what I can say, right, and very briefly, uh, well, I don't know yet because I have not looked into that back yet. <laughs> so because since I cannot go home, I would love to look into that back, but my guess would be that <laughs> If you see the people who sit in the in, in the previous government, previous government and the military government, including the current government, at least six, seven or eight of them used to work for tax mm. This is so ironic that how can this be, you know, when when you can see the difference between taxing government in the past and then the military government, including taxing go, uh, including Beirut government now, basically this have been the same people. So no wonder why the populist, you know, policy has been sort of carried through to the to the to the to the, uh, the current period, mainly because these people worked with Taksin before and knew that this policy was successful, right? And then Prayut himself know that since I have nothing else to to, to offer you, mm -hmm. I must well copy, you know, from what what I was successful in the past. But again, I mean, there is military men have not been trained to do economic policy. I mean, I I mean, this could be common sense, you know, you don't have to take to act academic to tell to tell you. But I mean it is true in a Thai context that they have little clue about how to deal with domestic economic policy, right? They can copy things, yeah. But what I see is that none of this policy has become long lasting or sustainable. There would be sort of piecemeal thing that would give to people. For example, they would hand out cash. Whereas Taksin have done more than that. That what that what I try to say, you know. Uh, you might look into the pouch there. You might you might see catch. You might see something. But I don't think I don't think people could have that trust in the government that whatever they are given right now would last into you know <coughs> at least the next five year or decade. Yeah. Such so just one quick interview. Sure. Follow up. Yeah. There was um, I once talked to a senior Thai official and I asked him this question about that and. He gave me the distinct impression that uh, even though these were toxins policies and they were now being adopted by the military, he felt that um, over time the Thai people would think it was the current government's policy. Do you believe the people that these policies are directed to believe that? The current, you mean that eventually they would be convinced that this is basically Purdue policy? Correct. That's what you say. I think I find it hard to believe. <laughs> so, uh, one of the things that I would never you know, um, I would never underestimate the intelligence of Rachel villagers today. You might be able to think that they, they were naive 20 or 30 years ago, but in the, in the era of social media, right, I don't think they're naive enough to suddenly, you know, become so convinced that, oh yeah, this is now, you know, a youth policy. I don't think so. The more they see that the current government took a lot, almost everything from Taksin, the more they become so nostalgic about the Taksin era, that had Taksin been here, we could have been better. We might, it might be okay now, but we might be better. That is my impression. I could be wrong. Steve? Uh, thank you. I'm Steve Winters, uh, independent consultant. Uh, I think in the interest of full disclosure, I'll just say I've actually had personal relations with some extremely rich families of Bangkok, and I think I understand where they're coming from. And I've also had very close connections at one point with U.S. military in Thailand, in particular Air Force Intelligence. And I would just say, so 
obviously Thailand is a very hard place to understand. And but the Air Force, for example, they they try to understand the intelligence so they can feed it back to the U.S. and then that influences U.S. policy. So if I were to take the standpoint of a U.S. agency trying to understand Thailand and uh, apply it to the way you presented the situation, I think the response would be it's sort of it's sort of like a black and white photo as opposed to a color photo. For instance, you mentioned the north and the northeast. So in the north, you have the former Shan states. In the northeast, you have the Laotian culture and the Lao Thai. And, and then if you get down uh, to what you're calling the royal networks, the problem there is that in the 30s, the military, in conjunction with the business people, overthrew the royal uh, establishment. So the old families that were related to the royals, the, the old aristocrats, actually, they lost a lot, and they've never regained it. So yes, you had a figurehead, very popular, symbolic head of the country, but the people running the country for a long time were the business establishment in conjunction with the military. At least this is the simplified picture. So you, you uh, and then finally about the princess, uh, you didn't mention her connections to the military. I mean, she taught at the military academy. I mean, she was the candidate of the military, so actually, uh, things a little bit different. So, given given this uh, more colorful view, how would you, how would you rephrase your analysis of Taxon and so forth and so on in the light of the actual uh, situation in Thailand, complicated as it is? So, you, Steve, is it is it fair to say that your question is, are these networks as defined as? Well, it's misleading as... calling it a royal network because you have a figurehead, so maybe one remaining member of the royalty, but it. That's not the person running the quote royal network. Is that my friend? Yeah, okay. I try to understand your question. Uh, uh, but that that doesn't dispute the fact that okay, the, the, you, you talk about the, the princess having you know a very good connection with the British. Yes, it is true. And then I didn't mention it because I cannot mention everything in my talk. <laughs> in fact, I was I mean when I was trusted in the past, I was invited by her to give lecture in the army as well. So now, nah, but but since you know we fell out sort of, so <laughs> uh, that cannot again that doesn't dispute the fact that that there was a little deep alliance between the military and monarchy, right? That if, if I want to if, if if I want to present it this way, whereas Taksin trying also trying trying very hard also to infiltrate into this kind of alliance, you know, at the beginning Taksin try so hard to please the military at the beginning. I mean, Taksin is sort of conflicting on these two. You know, on the one hand, pleasing the military, then maybe we would be spared of military coup. On the one hand. On the other hand, mm, or should we interfere and make and making sure that there was a kind of fragmentation within the military so that they could not stake a coup against me too. So Taksin sort of playing two ways, but what I'm trying to say is that Taksin also have been trying so hard to get into this. I'm not trying to present that everything sort of black and white. I also understand that it can be that colorful too. Sir, you were next, and then Michael Mosetig. And yes, please. I'm a Peter Humphrey, an Intel analyst and a former diplomat. So Big Brother next door uh, has a couple million people in prison. Uh, it has the top five worst prisons in the country. It has uh, designs to take over all independent countries in Asia through the Belt and Road Complex. And Thais are thinking, oh yeah, let's get closer to these guys. I mean, is this a failure of international broadcasting informing the Thai people? Is the failure of the Thai media informing the Thai people? Um, or is it a shared animosity to Muslims in the south of Thailand? You are talking based on your good logic. In reality, it's different. The, the reality which is different is that who is running Thailand today? Who is running Thailand today? These people have good logic. These people have democratic logic or not. Since they came to power, you know, by taking power, by you know, staging sta sta a coup, it would really suit them to work with a regime, you know, that would not come and lecture them. I I'm not saying that this is a good way for Thailand to go, but this is perhaps the only way that Thailand has to go at this point in time. If, as I said, that's why if Thailand has to choose between going with China and United States, maybe right now Thailand would want to go with China, knowing that all those bad things, you know, 
that would eventually get to us. But then, you know, uh, the, the the situation in Thailand right now, it, it doesn't seem to 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 give us any other option. I'm not saying that those. I mean, this is a good option. That's what I'm trying to say. In many way, though, there's also some study that you know China seem to provide s different kind of models that seem to be quite attractive for Southeast Asia. Believe it or not, you know, starting from business model into political model, very much top down. You know, we talking about the l e o k o k a n in Thailand, the largest you know private Chinese Thai company adopting this sort of economic model from China, very much top down, and these people have become powerful both in Thailand and in China. Why you expect them to walk away from all this and then going back to United States? Well, maybe circle back to that because I'm asking questions. But Michael, you were next. Uh, Michael Sadek, PBS Online News Hour. Appreciate your uh, coming and talking with us. You've described a stalemate, a domestic political stalemate. Does this get resolved politically, or are we likely to see a violent uh, outcome? <laughs> Pavan, can I just, just I, I wrote here. You know, the last time I've heard something expressed as a 16-year kind of crisis, I think you framed it as the long, drawn-out crisis, roughly 1650. It reminds me of E. H. Carr's 20 years crisis, uh, which led to World War II. But what in Thailand would trip Michael's question about? Well, any crisis that's that long and drawn out have either persists. Or there's something that changes the calculus. What would it be? Mm. If I could provide the right answer, then I would become the first president of Thailand. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> but it's a good question. I have thought about it. Right. I thought that there's three ways to unlock Thai politics. I mean, Thai political statement. I don't. I don't think that all these three are easy to do. Perhaps it would be all of them impossible. Yet. Yeah. There are options. The first one is, and and then there are three three layer or three tiers. We let's let's go to the first tier first, the highest one, from above, until they realize that they are leading Thailand into the abyss, that the military start to come to terms with what really happened in Thai politics, and they start to behave like the army in Indonesia. That maybe it's time for the military to walk out. This is just only the military. Then it would be even more difficult if you talk about self reform of the monarchy. I said, yeah, this is very difficult. You know, we have to talk about the less majestic law, which I have not even mentioned yet. Right, Article One One Two. How can we abolish this? Or even you know, talking about reform until these you know big organization institution realize that they they have done no good for Thailand and they decided to go ahead with the reform. Then I could see some kind of. The light at the end of the tunnel. It's very difficult, if not the most difficult. Second, second here is to achieve it through political process, electoral process. Okay, you have an election. Okay, you have political party. Political party would go into campaign, try to win hearts and mind of the people. Then you manage to win over. Then you set a government. Then you go with this process of amending the constitution to ensure that you strengthen the democratic institution to ensure that the military would behave badly, that you can control the military. Can you do it? Maybe, yeah, but it's difficult. Looking at what happening in the in the previous election with Thanh t h o n Jung Lung Lung Kit, with what with, with what you know has been uh, going on, you know, with his party, with the almost a mission impossible to amend the constitution, how to get it of the senator, you know, the senate. I mean, it's just difficult, and in fact, it has proven that maybe going that way might not be successful. Uh, have to refer to what I what I talked to t a k s i n t a k s i n even come to t e r m with you know all these political party that have been you know playing role in this the political process. He he said that at the end maybe the Thai Thai political party might be just a beautiful vase that you can only put the flower, but doesn't serve anything. Well, understandable. I quite like that comparison. Last one, it might be the easiest is the people power. So we have to think about. Uprising, and it had to be uprising at large scale. It cannot be 1,000, 2,000. You know, because we could end up like red shirt in 2010. It has to be to the point that you know people can no longer tolerate. You know, all the injustice that's happened in society, and then start to rise up. So I would only see three options, and with the last option, which I think 
it might be the easiest, but yet it's not easy. That would involve political violence. I'm sorry to paint a pessimistic picture. <laughs> you don't see economics as a potential driver, a failure of the economic situation or a crisis. I mean, after all, the 97 financial crisis in Thailand was important. Luck has been on Thailand on this point, but I don't know how long it lasts. I've said that luck has been on Thailand because Thailand has been a key player in the, in the international economy, right? Uh, all this, you know, chain supply, this and that. And then it seemed like key investors still keen to put money, you know, on Thailand. I'm not an economist, so I cannot give you, you know, elaborate answer, but I just want to give you one example. You know, uh, in my, in, throughout my stay in Japan, I have been discussing with a number of Japanese investors and they told me quite frankly that, you know, they're quite happy work, working with big data because it's one stop service for them. But the data is, the data doesn't suggest any yep. outflow of FDI in the, in the supply chains. If any, Thailand might see some come in because of the US-China situation. Rather yeah, than yeah. rather than a net out, <laughs> well, but we'll see. Okay, you're next. Yes, I, and I'll Anyways. follow up on that. But let let me ask first. I assume, since you're excluded from Thailand, but not just that. But how how is the monarchy discussed in Thailand now? Given that you still have this tight, let's not just stay and so on. Just yeah. how, how does that work? But more important, I I've, I've been given reason to believe that this new king is more in favor of big. Project, big infrastructure projects, for instance, than was Bumipan. And for instance, he's been more supportive of the Japanese-Chinese cooperation on this, this high-speed rail development. The Croc Canal is back on the agenda. Uh, other kinds of big projects. And I think the fact that Japan and China are working together on those projects really marks, is sort of a marker of how the Belt and Road could actually be very, very effective and that you could even get the United States to have the same approach, to collaborate on these kinds of development projects, and Thailand would be a, a key place where you have both sides very active. So monarchy plus Japan-China. Okay, briefly, how monarchy uh, has, uh, is discussed during Thailand. Uh, there could be some good news. I think the space of discussion of monarchy in Thailand, despite less majestic law, I think it has expanded gradually, and I think it's also thanks to social media. I think social media allow people to be anonymous to one extent, to the point that it could encourage you know people to to say what they want to say. So you could see, you you start to see now people would be willing to discuss monarchy more on social media, somewhat anonymously. But yeah, it's an encouraging trend. Secondly, you know, I mean, this is also judging from my own statement on Facebook too. You know, five years ago when I started to talk about monarchy on 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 my social media platform. Just a few people, you know, clicking like. This day, it could go up to thousands. Even clicking like in the past can be dangerous. That's why they banned me. Me among the three people have been banned online. Maybe the only case in the, in the universe that, you know, someone has been banned online. And I'm one of them. But then I'm, 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 I just want to also, you know, bring this up. So just to see the, the current attitude, I mean, the, the shifting attitude of the Thai public toward discussion about monarchy. And lastly, there was just a recent incident yesterday when uh, an actor went into the went into the cinema and if you know that before the cinema before the movie show you have to stand up mm -hmm. to listen to this glorifying song, this and that. One person did not stand up and then that guy took a photo of that man and then condemned this person on social media. The the Thai sort of go against the actor of of intruding into personal space you know whatever that person do in 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 their own way you must not interfere so what what i'm saying that this again if it happened a few years ago you would see pro-democracy groups coming out to support but you can see now that people go sort of against this kind of thing so what i'm saying that is is it quite encouraging the trend today uh, uh second about the uh, the, the king interesting in the in the big project. I do not have evidence on that. It, it, could, it could be my fault that I do not have evidence. But there is nothing that seem to seem to make me believe that the king had you know his hand on this big project. I do not see any connection. I think if anything, Thailand has have, have been playing this you know mega project with you know uh, big powers quite wrongly. I mean up to this point 
we still do not know who is going to do the high speed train for Thailand. You know, whether it would be Japan, whether it would be China. You know, I don't think I don't think the 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 the, the, the negotiation has become successful for both country. Or or I do not get the information. I don't know. But I I do not see the relationship between the monarchy and make and bigger project and make a project in Thailand. And then with the Bell and Road, this is another thing also. Not to mention that the first uh, meeting, the, the the Chinese leadership did not invite Thailand. So and then we try to you know make ourselves happy oh because we good friend and then, and then you know we don't have to be invited we already know what gonna happen hmm, I don't know <laughs> well <laughs> that lead to you know anyone else no interpretation uh yeah but that is one thing though you know even though when I'm trying to say that Thailand getting closer and closer to China it doesn't mean that that China could always play its own card against Thailand always. I'm not trying to conclude that. At some point, I think China also, you know, want to use this as an influence to to change the behavior of Thailand too. Not everything is rosy. That's what I'm trying to say when it comes to Thai Chinese relationship. It doesn't mean that we can get everything that we want from China. No, because in many way, China also said, "Look, we don't want that. If we don't want that, we will not give you that." What are the issues? I mean, one hears about the submarines. One hears about the the rail and the infrastructure. Uh, one hears that you know. So, what are the issues of divergence, or as you say, not good with China? And I mean, the submarine deal has become quite complicated, from my understanding. Um, a lot of issues. <coughs> sure. Uh, I think at the end, we have to also understand that China is not dealing with Thailand alone. China dealing with many different other country, right? And among different other country, whether Thailand would stand out among that other country, I am not so sure. So which means that China also pay attention to only certain thing for Thailand, not always everything for Thailand. So for example, when it come to the high speed train, well, there's a lot of complicated complicated issue. For example, you know we don't have enough money. We need you know loan from China. China said, you, okay, you want to get loan from us, you have to you know abide by our condition, which is not really soft loan, which is not really interest free. You know everything just like normal, like like any other country. So one try to say, yeah, we might we might want to please so much the Chinese leadership, but we should not expect that China would play your game always. And then China also, you know, realized also you want to buy submarine, you know, from China. You also buy, you know, other gadgets from the United States too. So the Chinese, you know, Chinese market is not the only market for Thailand, right? So you have to think carefully about these things. So that's why we also have to be careful that we don't see sort of coming back to black and white. Where is Thailand on Huawei uh, use utilization of Huawei? Where does it? I don't know where Thailand sits on five G and using Chinese products is. Uh, we hear about Philippines, we hear about... Um, I have not followed that. No, okay. I, have not followed that. Sure else. I think Jackson had relations with Huawei, didn't he? Didn't he? Huawei. Oh, on his IT business? Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> but it'd be interesting. Is there anyone that I met? Yes, sir, I didn't see you. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Please. I could probably finally uh, uh, some connection to Thailand. <clears throat> um, uh, you asked... You said we should ask about the princess in the election. So can you say what happened with Princess Won Rat's uh, candidacy? Mm -hmm. Mainly I'm interested in why it was blocked and did that tell us something about the relationship of the military and the king who has the upper hand? Going back to your original presentation about the king having uh, being a strong king but with the military. When I asked him I had to be so careful <clears throat> because you know uh, because I fear that he would not want to say it, but it seemed like he was keen to say it. So, first, the two have had good relationship. The two, I meant the former prime minister and the to be number one princess. Okay, they have had good relationship. So that's why lately we started to see them appear together, you know, at the football match in Moscow, in St. Petersburg, isn't that? Uh, that relationship has gone back many years. So, how can I say? Then at one meeting, uh, the princess happened to say that I'm interested in politics. And then the conversation went on 
when the question was asked, then what role you would see yourself in politics? Then the princess said, mm, I don't mind, prime minister, being prime minister. It's just like you go in supermarket and you can just pick it and you can just pick it and you can get it so easily in that position of prime minister. I said, okay, okay. In that case, you have to go and seek approval. And you know the approval from where, right? If you have the approval, I'm happy to support you. And the priest said, yeah, 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 yeah. Eventually she came back and she said, yeah, with the approval. So then it started with the political process by dividing into two parties. So I think I, I think the former prime minister sort of understand that there would be there would be an option of failure too. That's why that's why he split the party and then making sure that she would lead a smaller party. Hmm. Because I think I think he also expected that you know thing might may not go right, thing could go wrong, and then indeed thing went wrong when uh when she asked for the approval and the man said, okay, 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 not believing that she would be serious until, until the king realized the repercussion after the announcement of the princess being the prime minister, the candidate for the prime minister. The, the, the announcement especially came so, sorry, the, the repercussion came so strongly, in particular from the yellow shirt, not from the red shirt. The red shirt would be, you know, sharing up, but the, the, the yellow shirt would now condemning Taksim and also putting Obonrat into Taksim camp and that would further polarizing, uh, politi politicizing sorry, the, the monarchy, that's why. And, and this yellow shirt became sort of important foundation of the monarchy. So why the new king want to jeopardize you know, his support in the yellow shirt? So that's why he came to, uh, he came to, to do what he has to do. One of the things though that uh, there was a third hand in this in this incident and that came with uh, Princess Rinhorn. This is totally new information that after the new leak out or maybe after the announcement that Princess Rinhorn asked, you know, those with information told me she sort of interfered because she did not want uh, her sister to be a part of Taksim. So because of that, Sujinton got support from the military. Someone already mentioned about the relationship between Sujinton and the military. And, and, and that's why we get quite a strong uh, rejection from the military too. Someone told me that that was because of Sujinton was behind. But you consider that it was a, a blow or a damage to King Bachelor Longhorn? It could go both ways. It could go both ways. It, it would be positive for the, for the king. It would be short term. Positive in a sense that, you know, uh, First, it's allow the king to play politics legitimately. So basically, you you pull the king into the political ring and let him issue statements, right? So everyone even think that that was the right thing to do, and also to force this relationship between the military, the mon the, the monarchy, the military, and also the yellow shirt, middle upper class. That would be one of the short term good thing for King Washington. I think long term though, I I I would not want to discredit Taksin for his effort. In this in this incident, because I think in the long term, it's sort of uh, it's, it's, it caused damage of, of the monarchy too. Basically, because Taksin now bringing into the public the politicization of the monarchy, even self politicization of the monarchy too. Professor Strading, I think you're the last question. Please. Hi, Please. Beck Strading. I'm a visiting fellow here at East uh, West Centre. Thank you for a terrific presentation. Uh, you mentioned that, of course, Thailand has relationships beyond uh, the United States and China, and we do tend to sort of see these as being choices, but as you point out, it's, it's there's grey areas here, and often smaller powers like to leverage great power competition in particular ways. Uh, but I'm wondering how you see the domestic political conditions and this movement sort of closer to China affecting Thailand's relations with ASEAN states, particularly as there's a range of things going on. Um, I'm thinking about set a code of conduct in the South China Sea that play into this broader geostrategic competition. Okay. Particularly good time and good question because, of course, your Thailand is the chair this year, so it has to mediate or manage. And... 
I thought I could end my presentation quite easily. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But then you gave me that question. I think there has been a trend in ASEAN, in Southeast Asia, that a trend toward illiberalism. I'm not, I don't want to go too far to say author, authoritarian, you know, a gang up of authoritarian, authoritarian state. <coughs> but I think there has been a trend toward illiberalism in Southeast Asia. Why I say that? Because you see what happened in Thailand. You see what happened in Myanmar, Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. Oh my God. Then Singapore. Oh, Brunei. Then what else left? I'm not even so sure now with Mahathir here in Malaysia. Okay, maybe Indonesia. Putting aside. So, I mean, there is this trend. This trend seem to go well with the rise of China. So, to answer your question, whether Thailand relationship with China would affect, you know, other ASEAN, I don't think it's not much. If it would be negative impact on the region, if anything, it would encourage this rising trend of illiberalism to, in, to a point that it could create a dark hole within ASEAN. You know, as, as much as ASEAN talking so much about political uh, community building, you know, that's one thing that they, they, they can't discuss is basically democracy and human rights. And it's has been weak points of ASEAN for so long. And I don't think the, Thai, the Thailand Championship would be able to address uh, this, this issue. So it might not be good news. The relationship between Thailand and China, which has been much, um, I mean, we have, we have grown stronger, you know, it would only encourage encourage the current trend of illiberalism in Southeast Asia. You know, you don't have to, to go that far. What happened in Cambodia? You know, China has, has, has been, you know, making very successful inroads, you know, into this country, smaller country. You know, what happened to Cambodian China in 2012, you know, and this and that. And then for other big issues involving China, Thailand really plays safe. For example, South China Sea, you hardly heard any, you know, uh, position of China, of Thailand on this issue. Thailand basically sitting on the fence. You know, uh, we, if we're not involved, then why should we, you know, give any opinion on it? So, I don't think it's encouraging. Well, on that note, we've come exactly to the time we must end. But uh, before we thank um, Pavan for a really terrific hour and a half uh, on Thailand and issues related to Southeast Asia that we ended on, let me just advertise one event tomorrow for you or your colleagues might be interested. We're looking at various infrastructure projects across the region, particularly mainland Southeast Asia. And Scott Morris at the Center for Global Development uh, is coming tomorrow to talk about his paper on the Kunming Vientiane Railway as an example of the sustainability of BRI projects. So that's tomorrow from 12 to 1.30 if you're interested or if you wish to pass along the information. Second little promo advertisement, if you haven't signed up for our newsletters, publications, events, there's a form to do so or you can leave your card outside. There's a little uh, box. Um, we'll be happy to sign you up. We don't put anyone on our list, but if you want to be on our list, we'll be happy to do so. We generally take a little break in August on programming, so really great to have you, Pavin, and then Scott tomorrow. But I want to, again, please join me in thanking Pavin.